to Marines, I think. And you'll find it. It's a wonderful. Those guys are really into it. They've got their arms around one another and they're swaying and Bible studies with a confrontational attitude. He was Kansas City. Uh, 
Now we're continuing this series of 1 Peter, the outsiders. We are outsiders in this world. And Peter is talking to Christians about living their faith in a hostile culture. They're living in a time of Nero. They're under severe persecution, being thrown to the lions, being eaten, being burned alive, and all these terrible things that are being done to them. And Peter wants them to know how to respond. Because folks, it's human nature for us to respond to opposition with opposition. That's our human nature. So take it from a guy who cut off an ear of a man one time when, when Jesus was arrested. Take it from him and don't be impulsive, but be intentional about how you respond to persecution. And it begins as we've gone through over and over and we'll continue to do so because I think we need to get this down pat. He begins with knowing who you are. You are in Christ. You belong to Christ. You are a Christian. You follow Jesus. And that makes a difference. And so he begins there uh, and telling them, you're foreigners. Telling you, you're a foreigner. You're just passing through. You don't belong to this world. You belong to the world that is eternal. You belong to heaven. This world is not your home. And if I can remember that, if I can remember that my hope is not in this world, then it's okay. The stuff that is happening to me, the stuff that is happening to Christians is okay because it's temporary. We're going to live forever. And this world is not our home. And that perspective makes all the difference in the world. And our lives then should be marked with joy. Why? Because our hope is secure. Our hope will never fade. It will never spoil. It is kept for us. You have a reservation in heaven that cannot be canceled. Amen. And so we have joy. Uh, last week we talked about being humble, uh, about being holy, and having humility along with us. Now, holy is what? Holy is being set apart, being different, being distinct from the rest of the world. We are to be holy. But then he tells us, don't do that with the spirit of self-righteousness, which has driven so many people away from Christianity. I used to think that way. You know, all Christians are just a bunch of self-righteous, you know, and all that kind of stuff. But you cannot be that way. You've got to be holy. You've got to be distinct. But you've got to do it with a character of humility. The same character that Jesus had in Philippians 2, where he did not consider heaven something to be held on to, something to be grasped, but gave it up and become, became one of us, became a humble human being. And so this week, we're going to be challenged to respond as outsiders in this culture with conviction and compassion. Now, Peter knows that we're tempted to go along with whatever's going on in the world. We are tempted to just quietly keep our heads down and go along with what everybody else believes. And so many people water down the gospel, water down the truth of the Bible, uh, and uh, they don't conform to the Bible, but conform to this world. Now instead, we are challenged to live out our convictions. And he gives us some practical ways to do that. But the underlying message of it all is this. This book is the authority for our lives. It is the only authority for your life and for my life. This is it. And so that's underlying in this whole thing. Uh, here's the way Peter talks about it in 1 Peter 1, 24 25. <clears throat> all men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Now, in other words, people come up with some kind of idea or something and and uh, try to uh, get people to follow along with it, but it's going to it's going to wither, it's going to blow away, it's going to die. But the word of God, the Bible, stands forever, and, and and it will always be there. That is our standard. Now, in the last decade or two, there have been some major shifts in our culture uh, in what people believe, and what they believe about how the world works and how we live. Now, in the midst of these shifting beliefs, we are called by God to be a people of conviction. 
We believe it. We are convicted by it. So we need to understand the difference between belief and conviction. You see, belief is the acceptance of truth. I believe something because it's true. It's a cognitive thing. It's in your mind. You believe that something is true. But conviction is a demonstration of that belief. Conviction means you believe it and you act on it. You do it. You live the way that you've been called to live. You've been called to be a people of conviction. Uh, now, how do you know the difference? Well, these Christians were finding out the difference, you know? They, they, they could conform to the world and keep their head down, keep a low profile, and live. But those who were convicted wouldn't do that. They would live the Christian life regardless. So maybe you think you're a convicted Christian, but your family and friends begin to make fun of you for it, and you just kind of go quiet and go off in the other room or go off somewhere else and just be quiet about it. Folks, that's not conviction. That's just belief, okay? And we are called to be a people of conviction. The moment we begin to live out our beliefs, we become a person of conviction. And when we do that, it feels like we are indicting other people who don't believe what we believe. Now you get that? Once you begin to be a person of conviction, it feels like you are indicting other people. So a lot of people don't like it. And Peter writes about this in chapter 4. He says in uh, verses 4 and 5, They think it's strange that you do not plunge with them into the same flood of dissipation, and they heap abuse on you. But they will have to give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Keep this in mind when you're tempted to go along that, uh, and, and, and to just be quiet. You are responsible for the words that you speak. And they are responsible for the words that you speak to them. We are all responsible to the Word of God. Because one day, folks, we were saying about this earlier, one day we're all going to stand before God. And God is going to judge us. I want us to be a convicted people who are ready for the bride of Christ. Ready for that day when Jesus comes again. Ready for that judgment day. To be able to stand before him and say, I live the life of conviction. That's not going to get you into heaven. Only the blood of Jesus will get you into heaven. But God is looking for us who have accepted him as, as Lord and Savior. Who have been baptized into him and are living for him to live out a life of conviction. I, was, uh, I didn't have this in my house, but I was telling my class this morning. When I first became a Christian, I was a Dallas police officer. And I had a lot of friends. And I caroused with a lot of friends. And uh, I became a Christian and I was convicted day one. I mean, I was convicted. The next day, I went back to the police department and I started telling my friends about Jesus. Now, there was some good response and there was some bad response. But the people that I was the closest to, every one of them, I took them out for a cup of coffee and I sat across the table from them and I explained the gospel. I lost almost every friend I had. I really did. Because now they're being indicted, right? My best friend, Tim, did not become a Christian, at least while I was there. I'm, I'm not sure the later part of life, but he's gone now. But he believed in me. And he stuck with me and stayed my friend. And I did not have to water down the gospel to keep a close friend. You don't have to do that. Uh, <clears throat> they are responsible for the word that you speak, and you're responsible. And increasingly, the tension comes when you are called to be convicted and at the same time called to be compassionate. Now these two things are often expressed as, as contrary to one another. That if you're convicted, you cannot be compassionate. And uh, people have felt, and maybe we have felt, that if I am convicted, I can't be a loving person. Because if I say this, and I'm convicted of this, that makes this not true. Both things can't be true. Okay? So if I'm convicted of that, then uh, I get labeled as being intolerant, and that is a word that gets thrown around a lot, isn't it? The dictionary definition of tolerance is to recognize and respect 
others' beliefs, practices, etc. Without, and this is key, without sharing those beliefs and practices. Okay? To respect them, to recognize them, but you don't have to share them. And that's the right kind of tolerance. That's tolerance we ought to have. That's tolerance that Jesus had. As a Jewish man, Jesus violated many cultural uh, beliefs. But he, of course, uh, went with the word. All right? So he, uh, but he respected other people's beliefs and he valued them. So we can, Jesus is saying that you and I can respect someone and treat them properly and have compassion for them and at the same time know that what they believe is wrong. That's not being intolerant, okay? That is tolerance. Now, there's a book out now called The New Tolerance, and it says that about 80% of the time when you hear the word tolerance, it is understood this way. Every individual's beliefs, values, lifestyles, and perception of truth are equal. Folks, that's absolutely ridiculous. If one thing is, is true and another thing is the opposite of that truth, they cannot both be true by the very definition of the word truth. You cannot say that people have a truth for themselves. That doesn't work. Something is either true or it's not true, and it is not tolerance to say it's okay. It's okay that both things can be true. They cannot be by the very definition of the word. And yet, that's how tolerance seems to be presented today. It's not enough to just respect somebody else's beliefs, but you can't say this is true and that is not true. Okay? Because if you do, you're being intolerant according to the world. And so when Christians talk like that, when Christians say this is true, that is not true, the abuse gets heaped on. And we, we are called names then. And so we're called intolerant and bigoted and narrow-minded. Uh, and no one likes to be called names, right? I mean, I don't like it. Do you? No, we don't like that. And so we're seeing a lot of churches today that are acquiescing on their convictions. And they reinterpret Scripture to match what is culturally popular. Okay? We were, when we were still looking for a place to worship last year, the year before last, whatever it was, one of the things we're looking at is renting space from another church, okay? And in renting space from another church, the other pastor that I was talking to uh, was very concerned about what we believe about uh, homosexuals and what we believe about same-sex marriage. I said, what do you believe? Because I know the Bible. I believe what the Bible says. And, and she began to tell me about how they had reinterpreted it. She told me this. And they looked at it all with a fresh eye, a fresh look. And that, uh, that that was just fine. As long as they loved one another, that was just fine. Well, what does Scripture say about that? Let's look at 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Do you not know <clears throat> that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now get this, and that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So the question comes up. Every once in a while somebody asks me this question. Do you accept homosexuals in your church? My answer usually is something like this. Do we accept thieves? Absolutely. And then we teach them to stop stealing, right? Okay. Do we accept swindlers? Of course we do. And then we teach them, you don't swindle anymore. It's wrong. Do we accept homosexuals? Absolutely. And then we teach them, your homosexual activity must cease because it's wrong according to the Word of God. It's no different than these other sins that are listed. They're all there, and we are open and accepting to everyone, but at the same time, we tell sinners, you must stop sinning. That's what Scripture says. That's what the Word of God says. Now, why are we telling them that? Because I want them to go to heaven, right? I want you to go to heaven. Some of you have been thieves. 
Some of you have been liars. Some of you have committed other atrocious sins that I'm not aware of. I've done things that you're not aware of. We all have. We are all sinners before God. And I want us to go to heaven. And that means I've got to stop doing those things and live a life of commitment. Amen. 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 All right. Uh, in our culture today, though, here's what the, the Word says in 2 Timothy 4, 3. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a, a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. If you never hear anything preached here that bothers you, that's a red flag. Some of the things I say ought to bother you sometimes. Okay? It just should. Because I'm not here to tickle your ears. I'm not here just to make, I'm not a positive speaking, not a positive mental attitude speaker. I believe in positive mental attitude, I do. And I think we ought to live a life like that. But that's not my function. My function is to draw us to Jesus. That's what it's all about. Because we want to go to heaven and we want others to go to heaven. Amen. So throughout 1 Peter, Christians are called to be people of strong convictions even when it costs us something. Uh, I preached this, uh, I, I remember one time preaching <coughs> racial equality. And as I, as I started in on the words and, and was preaching that message, I saw a family in the back. This is a long time ago. This is when we had like 300 people. But I saw a family in the back get up and walk out. And it hit me. I, I know them. And I know they've, they've got kind of a bigoted attitude. And so they didn't want to hear that. They didn't want to hear the truth of the Word of God. I am not, you know, I don't like people to leave the church. I, I want people to be in church. I want people to be a part of this fellowship. But I am not going to just tickle the ears for somebody to say. I'm going to stay with the Word of God regardless of what somebody else thinks. Uh, and so it's not... Uh, I forgot to change the page. Uh, we have this strong call to be convicted, but we also have this call to be compassionate. Now, if we have this conviction, sometimes we think, that means I've got to be angry. And the more convicted I am, the angrier I'm going to have to be. And if it gets strong enough in us, you know what it becomes? It becomes us versus them. And we start making the people that we are called to love into the enemy. And we're called to love them. Uh, we, turn, we, we make them the opposition. And when that happens, the enemy wins. The opposition wins. We are called to be a people of conviction. But how are we to be known? Jesus said, this is how they should know that you're my disciples. Remember that? What is it? Love. Go ahead and say it out loud. What is it? Love. love. By your love. This is how people will know who you are. By your love for one another. Uh, Jesus said, I give you a new command. To love one another. Now, that's not a new command. I want you to think about this. In the Old Testament, that command was there. Love one another. So what's the new part? As I have loved you. That's the new part. Love one another as I have loved you. How is that? Jesus, I gave up my life for you. I gave up everything for you. Love each other that way. Love each other with that kind of conviction. That's how we're going to be known. And it's a whole new way to think about this. And that is the Jesus that Caleb was introduced to in John chapter 8. 1 Peter 3 verses 8 and 9. Finally, all of you live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic. Love as brothers. Be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing. Because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. And also in 1 Peter 4, 8 and 9. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Second Peter, I'd rather first Peter 2.15. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. 
Somebody says, well, but wait a minute, Ed, we've got all these signs and we've got these megaphones and we ought to be marching up and down outside abortion clinics and other places that are just wrong, and they are, okay? We ought to be just telling the world and, and, and shouting it out in our anger and doing all of this stuff. We need to be intimidated. Listen, Christians have tried all that. It hadn't worked. Let's try this. Let's try loving people, caring about people, being compassionate with people, and being convicted of what we believe without giving in to what the world is saying. So when people begin to witness our compassion, they'll begin to care about our convictions when they see that kind of thing happening. Now it's easy to, to agree with someone who agrees with you. Who, it's easy to be respectful to them and to love them. But we have an opportunity to live out the kind of love that Jesus demonstrated. 1 Peter 2, 21 to 23. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in His steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in His mouth. When they hurled their insults at Him, He did not retaliate. When He suffered, He made no threats. Instead, He entrusted Himself to Him who judges justly. When you're tempted to trade punch for chunk, punch, insult for insult, remember Jesus hung on that cross and said, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. We need to love the way Jesus loved. There's a book uh, by Rodney Stark named The Rise of Early Christianity, How to Obscure Marginal Jesus Movement 